I don't know what gun I have. Like, it's like I'm using that A10 Warthog mother. Uh, I don't know why I'm like. I'm gonna get, oh, f Should we cut that out, Sam? Is it okay? <laughs> Today's sponsor are the legends over at Vessi, who make 100% waterproof, not water resistant, waterproof shoes that make embracing water an absolute joy. No more soggy socks, no more uncomfortable shoes. Vessi not only create amazing waterproof products, but they also support organizations that protect and create water, which is a nice bonus. So let me tell you about why Vessi's are truly special. Honestly, uh, off the talking points here, I have worn nothing but Vessi's for like two years right now. I'm wearing a pair right now you can see these are definitely well used but still clean because if you get them dirty you just like uh, a little bit of wash and they're waterproof and it's super easy nothing to worry about these are that they're, they're waterproof boots and they're fantastic there's probably some b-roll of me standing in a river with these right now the water just flows over them like they're i think americans call them rain boots we call them wellies um in britain and the incredible shoes. But it's made possible by something called Dymatex, which is this uh, apparently waterproof material. This is another shoe design that they have. This one is brand new and fresh out the box. It still smells new. I can't wait to wear this. I keep this one nice and clean so I can show it on camera, unlike the boot, which I've been wearing for 18 months solid. Plus, also, you might think, oh, waterproof is not going to be very breathable, but it is breathable. I don't know how they do it. My feet are never sweaty. It's waterproof. It's the perfect shoe. You'll never wear anything else. Say goodbye to all of your other shoes and just get Vessies. Plus, they've got laces on here, but you never really need to use them. You just slip them on. Also, when you first get them, they feel too tight, but that's intentional. You order your right size, put them on, walk around in them, and then they adjust to your feet, which is amazing. It's something called four-way stretch, I think. It's like a second skin is how they describe it. And plus, I've got an exclusive deal for you. Shop Vessi Styles at Vessi.com slash Blaze and use the code Blaze for 15% off your order. You won't want to miss out. These are fantastic shoes can't recommend them enough and now back to today's video hello everybody welcome back to another episode of brain blaze i as always am your host simon welcome welcome to the program the dark origin of popular holidays and festivals written by daddy read by me let's just jump in shall we halloween <laughs> daddy daddy there's no introduction i love you <laughs> we finally done it <laughs> Videos without introductions are just wipe a tear away from my eye. <laughs> what am I watching? I don't know, but I hate it. One of the saddest parts of becoming a grown up is that it kind of ruins Halloween. It used to be my fourth day of the year, fourth favorite day of the year, Christmas birthday and then probably a joke and then halloween what do you reckon guys after my birthday christmas and the annual village sausage tossing comp championships i knew it i knew it danny and i like we know each other i never met danny <laughs> i've never even talked to danny on the phone but we know each other through this very odd means of communication that we have <laughs> i felt something just now this is real there's something quite magical about carving a face into a pumpkin dressing up in a bin liner and marching around the neighborhood demanding free sh from strangers who fear that they might get their windows bricked if they don't play along. I, isn't it always like, trick or treat? It's like, please treat because I don't have a trick because my parents wouldn't let me have a trick because that's mean. <laughs> Of course, we never carried out the veiled threat of the trick elements of trick or treating. Oh my god, me and Danny. Da, 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 da. I don't know what that, that was, to be honest. I don't know what that was. I'm feeling like good today. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling upbeat. Yes, it's probably that lack of introduction. You have a poison in your mind, and the fact that you can't see it makes me so sad. Because we were good kids who couldn't be asked, but it kind of feels sad when you hit 25 and the neighbors start complaining that you're getting a bit too old for this nonsense. Still gotta make well. <laughs> That's nonsense. Gotta go out there, get that candy, sell it. <laughs> Although I still try to get into the spirit of Halloween today, it's not quite the same when you feel that you're on the wrong side of the door. Considering the, uh, yeah, I've never had someone come trick or treating. Um, one, because now I'm an adult, I have my own like place and stuff. Well, I live in an apartment building, so no one does that. And also, it's not really a thing where I live because I don't live in America. And we do in England, much less. But it's just not a thing. Here. Considering the uniquely spooky atmosphere of Halloween, we're obviously going to dig up a little darkness at the heart of the tradition, yet the origins are surprisingly light in comparison to some of the other annual excuses for mucking about or getting wasted or taking a day off work or trying to forget what exactly we're supposed to be celebrating. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Most holidays are Easter, why do I have a day off? Oh, it's something to do with Jesus and chocolate eggs. <laughs> As an adult, it's like, woohoo, no work! It's the best. 
In the case of Halloween, the celebration has roots in an ancient Celtic festival from over 2,000 years ago called Samhain. Largely observed in Ireland and Scotland, it was believed that the 31st of October was the one night a year in which restless spirits became visible and roamed the streets until they passed over into the other world the following day. Makes a lot of sense. Citizens would leave out food offerings and light candles to help guide the lost souls along their way. It is funny how we totally bastardized isn't it? It's like, yeah, there was this old thing. It's like, yeah, we leave it out some food for like spirits. And now what is it? It's like, let's carve some pumpkins. And usually it's almost, it's always to do with companies, right? It's always to do with money. <laughs> So I was like, why are we carving pumpkins? Well, there was a pumpkin surplus in 1937, and from that point onwards, Big Pumpkin decided that everything, and you know, it's like, oh yeah, money, of course, there's always money. Fucking humans and their capitalist bullshit which I love. <laughs> but they were also a little bit cautious of the evil spirits that might be mooching about during Samhain, and this was where the dressing up element came into play. Oh, okay. It's not fully. I mean, I didn't even mention the dressing up element, but I would assume that that was like big costume trying to get us to buy all sorts of shit. Rent it. I remember like renting Halloween costumes. It was expensive back in the day. I mean, I, it sounds like silly now, but it was like 25 pounds. You'd go to the, and this was like, 2000 and Wednesday, it was like university would dress up for Halloween. There was a Halloween party and you'd be obliged to get a costume of some variety which smells and was unpleasant to wear. I don't really like germs. <laughs> I was like, oh God, what is this? Why is there a beard? Oh, oh. But it would be £25 to rent this costume for Halloween. I was like, bloody hell. <laughs> The rest of the year is probably about 50p, but it's on Halloween, they know they've got you over a barrel. As well as lighting bonfires to ward off the less desirable spirits, followers of the tradition would dress up in spooky costumes to fool the ghosts into believing that they were all the same undead gang. It's not a million miles away from negotiating a path through a pack of zombies during the apocalypse by smearing yourself in rotten flesh and rancid guts to give them the impression that you're on Team Zombie. <laughs> that was a deep pull of an analogy, Danny. <laughs> Keen to stamp out hairy pagan rituals, the Catholic Church eventually developed its own Christianized version of honoring the dead in the 8th century under the name of All Saints Day, held on the 1st of November. But it was still a long journey to the Halloween that we recognize today. The term Halloween was first popularized in a 1785 poem by the Scottish poet Robert Burns. Very, very famous Scottish poet. Is Burns Night, that like Scottish celebration, is that named after Robert Burns? I think it is right? So he's a big deal. To describe the night before the big day, but many of the modern traditions didn't really take off until the Scottish and Irish arrived in North America in the late 19th century, and it wasn't until the 1930s that trick-or-treating became commonplace. Yet trick-or-treating was really just a tweaked spin on earlier traditions. As far back as the 16th century, the children of Scotland went guising door-to-door -door on the 31st of October. I've made a video about this years and years ago. Years ago. I have no idea why I remember this, but there's definitely some Today I Found Out video out there, probably from like 2017 or something, of me talking about the origins of Halloween trick-or-treating or something. It's just in my mind now. I'm like, I know this and I don't know why. It's usually because I made a video about it and then forgot everything because I've said many times, it's in the eyes, out the mouth, and it never enters the brain. It's like an art form. Otherwise, my brain would explode from its bigness. How small? Too small. Well, size isn't everything. Three inches? Well... Uh, so they'd wear masks, paint their faces, and go asking for apples, nuts, or coins. Lately, my daughter's obsessed with coins. Coins, I think because she sees us using them. Although we don't really use coins that much. But still, somehow I have coins. Like, I pay for almost everything by card whenever I can. But somehow, still have masses of coins everywhere. I don't know how. And my daughter's like, can I have coins? And I'm like, why do you want coins? And she's like, I want to put them in my piggy bank. And she has a little piggy bank, which is getting rapidly filled with my money. And then she's like, can we use it to buy ice cream? And I'm like, yes, we can. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> Sorry, back to the story. And even this was a tweaked spin on souling. I I definitely know this. I know this. I know guising. I know souling. At some point, it did enter my brain, apparently. <laughs> Got rid of that sh with practice. And it saw children and very poor and hungry adults knocking on the doors of wealthy strangers and begging for food in return for a prayer for their souls. Ha! <laughs> Fools on them. I don't believe in prayer or souls. So I'll be like, get out of here, you peasant. They were traditionally even cheap crap round cakes known as soul cakes. This echoes the disappointment felt by a modern day trick or treater when that nice old lady from down the road gives you a boiled sweet instead of cold hard cash to spend on cigarettes and fireworks. Can you imagine going trick or treating? It's like, yeah, have a, have a cigarette. I was about to use a British slang word there that we use for cigarettes that would get me demonetized. 
spent also cancelled. But I mean, I, you can't be cancelled for using it's it's f f a g, which is like slang for cigarettes in the UK. <laughs> can't use that. That's why I don't do live shows. The mischievous element of the implied threat behind trick or treating certainly seems to be a 20th century twist on this concept of begging, and not everyone is a fan of what might be seen as extortion, even if most kids just shrug and try next door when they are refused a treat. While I like to decorate my porch with pumpkins and skeletons and mechanical spiders, oh my god, Danny, really? <laughs> Is there like peer pressure in your village? Because I don't feel that anyone would do this unless like Peter next door is doing it. And then, you know, Deborah on the other side is also doing it. Oh, for fuck's sake, Peter. For fuck's sake, Deborah. Now I have to do this. It's like if people put up Christmas lights. Oh, for fuck's sake, I don't want to be like the one Scrooge who doesn't. But I also don't really want to spend my Saturday afternoon putting up fucking Christmas lights. Okay? I'm about to move house to a new neighborhood. But I live in an apartment right now. In about, well, I hope it'll be in like six months. Construction is ongoing. Um, and I really hope that it's not one of these neighborhoods where people put up Christmas lights. Because then I'll be like, oh, for f sake. <laughs> what the f is this piece of shit? Like right now, living in an apartment. The, the most we do is put up one of those wreaths on the door. And that's just because other people do it. <laughs> I have no desire to, like, make a wreath out of holly and sh and put it on the door. Jesus. God, I sound like a right prick, but I just I just don't like unnecessary effort. For, like, I want to, I'll do things if I enjoy them, if I'm paid for them, or if I have to do them. Like, going to the doctor and sh like that. But all of the other stuff that I don't get paid for, that I don't enjoy, or I don't have to do, I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> You know? Anyone else? Trust me. Everyone else seems to put up f***ing wreaths and Christmas lights. I, I know you don't want to do it. I know you don't. I know you don't. It's that f***ing peer pressure. Same reason I smoke. I don't smoke. I'm just joking. Don't smoke. Shut up and get to the point! What the f*** are we talking about? That was a rant and a half, wasn't it? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll get back to it. Danny decorating his porch. Oh my god, did we really get from Pete and Deborah to there? It. Other adults prefer to turn off all the lights and pretend that nobody's in. Big brains. In fact, one survey carried out by Norwich Union Insurance revealed that 58% of UK homeowners hide in the dark on Halloween, but I can't believe that to be true. I can, however, believe the one guy they interviewed who was seriously considering removing the cover from his doorbell so that greedy kids would come and electrocute themselves. That guy is the proper Grinch, isn't he? <laughs> isn't he? He's got a bunch of dead kids on his porch. He's like, good! I mean, they're, they're, it's a mains shock, right? That's a doorbell. Is that, is that piped into the mains? I don't know how that works. I've never installed a doorbell. Nowadays, isn't it just like a thing you'd like stick on with tape and then the battery lasts for like 100 years? I replaced the batteries in my carbon monoxide alarm the other day. There was like beep, and I'm like, why is that? Why is that sound? It's not the smoke alarm. I found that. Didn't have any batteries in it. I was like, oh. <laughs> Found my carbon monoxide detector hidden behind a picture. It's like there's a there's a shelf. Why am I talking about this? Sorry. Let's carry on. Labor Day. Don't know what the this is. This is an American one that I don't give a shit about. It sounds like a day where you have to go to work extra. Labor Day. Okay, now it's probably a day off, isn't it? I'm sorry, Americans. I love you. Thanks for watching. You're like most of my audience, <laughs> and I love you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I don't know why. <laughs> this is a deeply confusing entry on the calendar. As, I mean, I know why, because there's more of you. <laughs> That's the reason why. Everyone who makes channels in English, unless they're like super specific, like how to navigate the London Underground or something like that, they're gonna have um, an Amer a majority American audience because there's loads of you. There's like 300 million of you. Jesus. This is a deeply confusing entry on the calendar as most of the rest of the world celebrate International Workers' Day on May the 1st. <laughs> We do? <laughs> okay. Although some countries refer to it as Labor Day or May Day. May Day. I know May Day. Oh, that's what we call it in the UK. How exciting. I've learned something new about America, which is not to be confused with the other May Day. People were absolutely roasting me. Was it on this channel? When I was like talking about <laughs> the city of Michigan in Chicago or something, the state of Chicago. And people were like, Simon, come on. <laughs> Just uh, come on. Come on. Or was it Detroit, Michigan? Chicago, Michigan? Oh god, are Chicago and Michigan both? I don't know. That whole thing is confusing. If you're not going to make an effort, then just leave. 
uh, which is a festival marking the beginning of summer. Although International Workers' Day has origins in the U.S., citizens are more likely to celebrate the entirely different national holiday, Labor Day, which, just to add to the bewilderment, is held on the first Monday of September. Okay, why are we talking? We're talking about two different holidays then, aren't we? How are they connected? Your intellect is as weak as your dollar. Let's stick with the US version of Labor Day for now. It's generally regarded as a fairly low-key long weekend, which marks the end. It's up to you if that long, long weekend is low-key, though, Daddy. What if you really tear it up? What if you have a gra grand old time? It marks the end of the summer and the imminent reopening of the schools. Oh, my God. Do you guys remember? And it was it just me? It's not just me. I know all of these things where I'm like, is it just me? And I'm like, no, other people feel this way, for sure, because it's like, I have a regular brain. Um when it was like we we go back to school in september in in september in the uk in early september and there'd be like that final sunday before going back to school for a whole year after like we, we had like nine weeks summer holidays and it was like you're off school for nine weeks and then there's that sunday before you have to go back before the monday where you find out what your horrible timetable with double maths is going to be and for some reason my parents would always go to like this family friend of ours called hillary and ian <laughs> Why do people care? No one cares about this. But we'd go and they had kids and we'd all play together, have a great time. And the whole time, all I'd be thinking was, I gotta go to school tomorrow. Ah! And it'd just be just filled with such dread. Now, Sunday rolls around as an adult, and I'm kind of like, hey, work tomorrow. Let's around with videos. Woo! <laughs> it's really nice. I don't dread it anymore. <laughs> It's a good sign, right? It's a good sign. Apparently, this day off is intended to recognize and celebrate and reward the hardworking and achievements of American laborers by giving everyone a well-deserved extra day off to go shopping or enjoy a barbecue or something. But some might also view it as a piss-taking kick in the toiler's teeth. The very first Labor Day held in New York City in September 1882 was fair enough. It was organized by the Central Labor Union as a way of bringing together workers for a festival day of picnics, barbecues, and fireworks, although the New York Tribune described it at the time as one long political barbecue with rather dull speeches. The idea began to spread over the next few years as several other states began to recognize Labor Day as a holiday, but it wasn't until 1894 that President Cleveland signed a bill into law which made Labor Day a federal holiday to be celebrated on the first Monday of September. I have to say, like, if you're the president or king or whatever i know president like the king doesn't do dick anymore like or sausage fingers <laughs> which is a meme i've been enjoying the shit out of lately <laughs> um king charles has like sausage fingers if if people didn't know like <laughs> i have like quite short fingers but at least they're not sausagey um what was i talking about i don't even remember let's move on oh yeah like if you're president and you want to be liked just be like this is now a holiday like we just do it third 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 saturday uh third friday in in july it's a national a federal holiday boom people would vote for you right it's that simple that's what i'd do i'd be like you know i i'm like the class president star election that's the sort of election i'd run i'd be like yo 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 you vote for me five extra holidays <laughs> five extra holidays because most people are workers most people want that sure there's going to be some very powerful people who are like no 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 that's bad for business but most people are workers <laughs> just be like five more holidays we're just not going to work in december when does the parliament go on a, uh is it the senate or congress they just fuck off for like the summer everyone gets to do that President Simon! No thanks, I choose life. His motives, however, may have been a little dubious. We have to remember that a laborer's life during the 19th century was a little bit grim, as many people were expected to work 70 hours a week without so much as a day off. That's fairly similar to Simon's work schedule, albeit he doesn't tend to work down in a mine shaft. Uh, my work schedule for many, many years was very heavy. Now I don't work nearly as much. I probably work like normal person work, but I work 70 hours a week for a pretty long time making videos. So look, it's not really work, is it? I just liked it. And yeah, why are we talking about this? <laughs> Trying to make myself look like a right hero. Yes! <laughs> because I am. Towards the back end of the century, the overworked and underpaid laborers were starting to get a little bit annoyed about all of this when the largely divided new unions weren't bickering amongst themselves. They were campaigning for shorter weeks, days off, less hazardous working conditions. <laughs> rubbish. Absolute rubbish. <laughs> and proper chocolate dispensing machines. A one such rally held in Haymarket Square in Chicago on May the 4th, 1886, was meant to be a peaceful demonstration in support of the ongoing general strike for an eight-hour working day. But it ended in violence and tragedy when clashes beget between protesters and police got out of hand and some idiot lobbed a bomb at the police who responded by firing into the innocent crowd. Well, 
they were an innocent crowd until someone threw a big bomb at them, Danny. Jesus. If I was the police, I'd just like rain and be like, all right, mother I don't know what gun I have. Like, it's like I'm using that A10 Warthog mother. Uh, I don't know why I'm like, you know, yeah. oh, should we cut that out, Sam? Is it okay? <laughs> Can I, like, I know police violence is a little bit of a hot spot, so if I'm like, you know, mimicking the A10 Warthog into a crowd of union workers, it's not exactly a good look, is it? But it's a joke! Leave it in! Leave it in. Leave it in. We'll see how things play out. Seven police officers and at least four civilians were killed on that day, while seven more civilians were fired and on and killed by police the following day, including a schoolboy and a man peacefully feeding chickens in his own yard. Deserves it. In unions. <laughs> I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Just to be clear. Four so-called anarchists or strike sympathizers were ultimately executed in what was widely seen as a terrible miscarriage of justice. <laughs> widely seen. How people were like, well, you know, people weren't actually like, he deserved it. Chicken feeding prick. You disgust me. It was these events which inspired the rise of Workers' Day on May the 1st as a holiday that honored the rights of workers. But whilst the rest of the world was largely stuck with this May tradition, the US went on to take a slightly different path. A few years later, the 1894 Pullman strike was also destined to end badly when the railroader George Pullman slashed employee wages by 30% but refused to slash the rent charge this company down accordingly. Oh my god. You know what we talk about? Like, if you're new to this channel, like I'm a capitalist. I think the capitalist system does work quite well, but it's also super f***ed up, like, because of this. <laughs> and I'm always like, let's just do capitalism because we need an economic system, but let's not be dicks. And the, the f***ing company towns is like the epitome of, like, dickishness, right? It's like, how's this working? Well, we're not going to pay you money. We're going to like pay you coupons, basically, because you shop in our shops, you rent our houses, you work in our factories. And it's like, wait, <laughs> when did this become a fucking labor camp by any other words? Jesus. This prompted a strike in Chicago, which quickly gained traction across the U.S. with full support from the American Railroad Union. With 125,000 rail workers across 29 railroads now on strike, the federal response was to send in the troops to shoot the strikers in a bid to protect the mail. You can fuck right off with that. The strike came to a halt very quickly afterwards, but only after 34 strikers had been killed. And it was during this period that President Cleveland generously decided to make Labor Day a national holiday. What a fucking hero. <laughs> I wonder why he did that just out of the goodness of his little Cleveland heart. It's believed by many that this was a conciliatory, conciliate, conciliatory, conciliatory, consigliatory <laughs> gesture to shut down criticism of his handling of the Pullman strike. <laughs> <laughs> what did he do? Well, I sent in the military to shoot people who didn't want to work because they were getting exploited by a shitty system. Um, that's not good, but, but, federal holiday. Boom. It's also believed that he purposefully chose to celebrate Labor Day as a less radical alternative to the perceived anarchy and extremism of the events that inspired Workers' Day in May. But it's a little disturbing that President Cleveland was pushing Labor Day as a jolly celebration of the achievements of workers while simultaneously sending in the troops to quell a strike from underpaid workers. <laughs> Perhaps it's a useless concept anyway these days. It would be nice if every laborer could enjoy a day off. But bearing in mind that most shops and fast food chains and restaurants are still open for business, that's clearly not the case. You have to say, bye. <laughs> It's really selfish, but I don't like holidays sometimes because the, all the shops are closed and stuff. And it's like, what the f am I supposed to do? I wanted to go to the butchers to buy some dinner, and now I have to order food in and not cook. This is outrageous. <laughs> this is outrageous. Get back to work, peasants! If you happen to work at McDonald's, I'm afraid Labor Day isn't for you. Valentine's Day. This one is. Wait, don't they mandatory close like this? Like, to be fair, they don't close McDonald's, but there's a rule here. Where on national holidays, shops over a certain size legally cannot be open. So, like, big supermarkets and stuff, closed. Like, there's a square footage or a square meterage. And if you're over that, you have to be closed for the holidays. And they, there was, like, some stores that were open and they got, like, big fines. This one is not exactly a national holiday, but it's certainly a very special oh, Valentine's Day. Did I read the title entry? I'm sorry. But it's certainly a very special day for loved up couples and purveyors of chocolates and roses, if not quite so special for single people who spend the evening eating self-gifted treats while listening to Morrissey at full volume. <laughs> Ah, oh, yes. I'd never really given much thought to the origins of Valentine's Day or how the winged arrow slinging chubby baby Cupid became the day's unofficial mascot. I feel like Hallmark's gonna get involved at some point, isn't it? Or how it evolved into the annual celebration of romance and a lucrative goldmine for Hallmark. Oh my god. 
Danny. I believe I am psychic. I just imagined it all had something to do with true love and teddy bears, but of course it did. And the day is meant to be a Christian feast honoring a martyr named Valentine, but the exact origins are decidedly murky, as there were busloads of martyrs by the name of Valentine, and nobody's quite sure which one we should be honoring. It could be the Saint Valentine from the Roman Emperor of the 3rd century who helped Christians escape from Roman persecution but was jailed and eventually executed for his crimes. Yeah, it's that one. <laughs> that sounds related. <laughs> The legend goes that he fell in love with the jailer's daughter and shortly before his execution he sent her a card signed from your valentine accidentally spawning an entire industry along the way that just sounds like something someone may i mean wait was this a bible story or like some some ancient myth stuff like that so obviously it's made up but this sounds like 20 20th century made up by like hallmark or like you know de beers two months salary for an engagement ring that that kind of made up you know like let's get people to buy expensive sh- that's really worth nothing that they don't need. But the most popular version of the story relates to St. Valentine from roughly the same period, who was a Christian priest who may or may not have been the same man. Wait, the same man as who? Oh, it's the same man as the one in the previous entry. Okay. During the reign of Claudius II Gothicus, that's a fucking name, isn't it? The emperor was getting a bit miffed, Gothicus, over the... <laughs> Over the decrease in young men willing to sign up for military service, it seems that men were now preferring to settle down with their wives and kids instead of traveling to a distant land to fight in a war. Uh, what the fuck? That is the highest calling of men everywhere. Join the army, go off to kill people who are also just being manipulated by people in charge because of lands that will exchange hands and oh my god, war. Crafty Claudius reckoned that there was only one viable solution to this. He outlawed new marriages so the potential new soldiers wouldn't be able to use a wife as an excuse for staying at home. <laughs> well, I'll just say that you can't you say, just, you have to go to war anyway. If this conscription is not like, oh, you're married, that's cool. Because then everyone will be like, I gotta get married ASAP to someone who I don't even like. Get divorced later. We just gotta get through the war, baby. What a bothersome husband. <laughs> Come on! But the priest Valentine wasn't having any of that. He continued to perform illegal marriages against the wishes of the emperor. It could be the case that he was an old romantic on a risky mission to oversee the marital union of truly devoted couples in direct defiance of the law or and i know it comes up a lot because i'm a cynical fuck, but he's got a little bit of that you know it's like yeah yeah yeah, i'll marry you i'll marry you no worries 100 pounds <laughs> Or perhaps more likely he could have been marrying off potential soldiers in a bid to prevent them from ever being called into battle or Either way, it didn't end well for Valentine. After being arrested and still refusing to renounce Christianity, Valentine was tortured, beaten with clubs, and beheaded on the 14th of February 269 AD. Nice. Maybe Hallmark should be depicting pictures of Valentine decapitate, Valentine's decapitated head on their cards instead of a cute little Cupid. Where the f*** does Cupid come from? They may as well, as it turns out, the Cupid was actually meant to be a bit of a knob. Oh. Okay, largely basis. <laughs> like Danny, so we, me and Danny are like absolutely vibing out today. Mm. Largely based on a Roman interpretation of the Greek god Eros, the original Cupid was a grown-up troublemaker who toyed with people's emotions by simultaneously firing two very different arrows at potential couples, provoking uncro- uncontrollable desire in one of the victims alongside utter revulsion in the other. <laughs> oh my God! How the hours must have flown by for Cupid. It was only during the 16th century that Renaissance painters reimagined Cupid as a matchmaking little baby, and it was this sweeter version that became embraced by modern romantics. Geoffrey Chaucer and William Shakespeare had a hand in helping to romanticize the concept of Valentine's Day and their work and the idea of exchanging homemade cards began to really take off in Europe from the 18th century. But it was only when Hallmark began mass-producing Valentine's Day cards in 1913 that it developed into the mainstream soppy tradition that many of us observe today. But next time you buy a Valentine's Day card, remember that you may be honoring a tortured and beheaded priest by buying a card depicting a god who screwed up lives by behaving like a massive bellend. Yeah, I mean, but... If this video is teaching me any, everything, it's like all of our holidays come from some bastardized version of a previous holiday, other than the good holidays, like Shark Week. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> yeah. Thanksgiving Day. Perhaps finally. But I feel like Thanksgiving Day is the American holiday that I know most about because it's so talked about, it comes up in videos, it's in movies. It's like Christmas for Americans a month early where you eat all the Christmas food, like turkey and cranberries and stuff. We eat that on Christmas in the UK. That's normal. <laughs> you eat like smoked ham or some shit on Christmas? It's <laughs> weird, bro. Finally, one of the strangest celebrations of all is the North American version of Thanksgiving Day, during which citizens celebrate a special moment in history by feasting on turkey, pumpkin pie, and if you're really lucky, sweet potato casserole topped with marshmallows. What the f***? 
I know about it, but still, like, what the f*** is that? Why? School children are taught that they're meant to be celebrating their glorious first unofficial Thanksgiving Day in 1621, when the recently arrived pilgrims first shared a feast with their new Native American buddies in Plymouth Colony. You remember how it went. The Wampanoag tribe had apparently befriended the struggling pilgrims and helped them to survive the harsh winter. I feel like I've also made a video about this, and it's just like... Oh, not true. <laughs> the celebratory meal, not yet known as Thanksgiving, was a symbol of the lasting bond between the pilgrims and the Native Americans who shared food and cracked jokes and engaged in drunken arm wrestling competitions. The Native Americans went on to generously concede most of their land to the pilgrims and everyone lived happily ever after. Oh no, it didn't though. That's not the... That's not history. Of course, that's not exactly how things panned out. The Jolly Union was probably a little more tense than that. The Wampanoag tribe initially assumed that they were under attack from the pilgrims and they ultimately formed an uneasy alliance with the newcomers to help keep the tribe protected from their own rivals. The Native Americans would soon see their numbers rapidly decrease after they became infected with diseases brought by the new European settlers. Other Native Americans would be subject to a grislier fate. A grislier fate than f***ing smallpox? Dude. The actual name of Thanksgiving is first believed to have popped up in 1637 when colony governor John Winthrop used it to describe another celebratory meal, but this one was blatantly celebrating conflict rather than it being a cool party. After the dead body of a white colonist was discovered in a boat, armed settlers responded by burning a Pequot village to the ground and hunting down anyone who tried to escape. The governor launched the subsequent celebration, sometimes considered the first official Thanksgiving Day, with the words, This day forth shall be a day of celebration and thanksgiving for subduing the Pequots. A day of thanksgiving, thanking God that they had eliminated over 700 men, women, and children. That cannot be real. Is that real? That's extremely bad. And I don't know, I'm not surprised. I mean, I am a bit surprised. I already know, like, colonism and, like, that was really bad. But that's really bad. President Abraham Lincoln later declared Thanksgiving Day a national holiday in 1863, and the rest is history. Well, that's a bit of a silly thing to say, as all of this is history. But is it history that should be celebrated? <laughs> I mean, the, the modern thing is like really different. We're not like with the Valentine's Day one. We're not celebrating the guy with his head chopped off. We're celebrating the modern concept of it. Like, I'm sure Thanksgiving Day is like different modern concept than like genocide. But still, maybe not. Right? It's pretty. Up. Considering that the original, unofficial, joyful feast was rendered a bit meaningless after a devastating war later broke out between the colonists and the Native Americans, all this leaves a bit of an unpleasant aftertaste in the pumpkin pie. Many people prefer to consider Thanksgiving Day a national day of mourning and a reminder of the plight of Native Americans. Yeah, maybe you could involve that as well. Like, why not do the regular Thanksgiving stuff? I mean, no one's celebrating colonism. Colonialism? With uh, Thanksgiving, they're being thankful for stuff. And then maybe also add this in. It feels a bit weird. I'm just talking about a topic that's got nothing to do with me. Like, I mean, like normal. But this one feels particularly like, <laughs> don't stick your foot in it, whistle boy. <laughs> don't get involved. Don't get involved. Don't dig a hole. Don't even start digging a hole. <laughs> And it's far from being the only example of a proud national celebration brimming with blood. Look at Australia Day. While many Australians are happy to get another day off work, raise the Australian flag, and wrap a stubby holder around another tinny mate. Okay, it's all, that must mean like a beer cooler, like the thing that holds the beer with the tinny, which must be the beer inside. Let me know, Australians. It's often overlooked that they're effectively celebrating the brutal British conquest of Aboriginal land. The indigenous population often prefer to call it Invasion Day or Survival Day. Yeah, this video became a lot more uncomfortable towards the end, didn't it? I hate it. Perhaps part of the problem with national holidays and festivals is that most people have either forgotten or don't really care about the origins of a day, which is usually celebrated with family and friends just getting together to have a good time. When Good Friday kicks off, a welcome long weekend, not many people are spending the whole day thinking about some guy getting his hands nailed to a cross, although a lot of religious people are aren't they? I'm just here for the chocolate bunnies. So maybe it's time we moved on from having a rowdy piss-up to celebrate hungry beggars, massacres, and strikers getting shot dead by police. I propose that we instead start, start celebrating 20th of July as Happy Moon Landing Day and April the 22nd as International Big Mac Day. Let's just add those. Let's just do those as well. Everyone except people who work at McDonald's, obviously, but they could always just go on strike. No, this is turning into a bad idea. Oh, it's too complicated. I just want more days off. Let's go. Thanks for watching. That's where the video ends. Danny. Danny. There's no introduction. I love you.